Thank you, Alec. Um, I'm just glad it's not Pink Panther this year. That's a, I feel like I've been promoted. Um, but thank you very much and thank you for the welcome. Um, so, so Alec and I had a very long discussion about, about today because uh, last time I not only ran out of time, but I think everyone felt quite depressed afterwards. So I don't want to be the bearer of bad news the whole time. There, here and there I'm going to uh, say things that I, that I believe are important to say. But I think the big question, and I can hear that from the majority of speakers, is how do we make impact? What are the different ways and formulas to make impact? And, and I think there are, are specific basic building blocks that we can use that each of us can play a, a, a role. But I want to set the table first. And I think most of you would have heard, read, I actually saw it's a poster in the back, Man in the Arena. Um, and and. I'm going to read it afterwards, so I don't want to uh, read it right now. But just as context, I, need, I think we need to understand where we are at regarding the whole crime issue. And I wouldn't have shared it, but this morning I, I got a call from a few cops, in, specifically in the Cape Flats. And just last night, 11 people were, were shot and killed in, in gang violence. Last week, 61. Week before that, 62. That's 123 people in, in 14 days. That's a war zone. You know, so we can talk about policies and we can talk about, uh, about a lot of, lot of historic things, but it's important that we understand we really need to change this. Um, doesn't simply, it's not just a political answer. It's not just a civil society answer. There are specific things that we need to do to change this. We, uh, it's kind of, it, it, something has to, something's got to give. So I've got two questions, and I guess they're rhetorical. I'm not going to wait for everyone to answer. You'd know what the answer is. But the first one is that, and these are, I guess, my, let's say, the, my foundation principles, is are you on the side of hope or on the side of hopelessness? Because it's a, it's a very intentional decision that you need to make. We need to pre-decide to be intentional about having hope. Now, to me, there's a, there's a link to faith with it. To other people, it might be something else. But regardless, there's a, a, a pre-decision that you need to make whether you are on the side of hope or hopelessness. The second question is, are you yet to serve or to be served? Because I think in South Africa, there's still a, a, an idea of, I, I only look to the inside. I, I've got internal care. In other words, I look to the inside with my back to society, I look after my family and I'm not there to serve. So in essence, I think the decision that you, that you need to make is that you're literally putting yourself second. And if each of us can have that approach of saying that I am second, I'm willing to serve and I'm on the side of hope, then I think your, your building block is, is correct. So no matter how you take it on, whether civil society, say, for example, on a local level, and we'll chat about that now, but on a local level, it's with taking part in neighborhood watch patrols. Very basic thing to some. But I promise you, a lot of people would say, you, but I, I need to sleep. Um, and I need to this and I need to that. But when it gets really bad in that community, then everyone's up in arms, including yourself. And then we say, but what could we have done? So, so... The first two things, am I on the side of hope or hopelessness? Are you there to serve or to be served? And I think the, the, the crucial part of this is that that forces us, when we say I'm here to serve, it forces us to take ownership of the problem. So there are many things, and I've, I've listened to so many, it's not specifically pertaining to this conference, but I often hear uh, a blame game being, being played. And I mean, uh, to be honest, I listened to Urban Mashaba yesterday. I was in in uh, um, in Fuleni in the Cape Flats, and we spoke about the multi-party charters uh, crime policy. And I agree with Herman when when he says we need to we need to put the blame straight in front of the door of a criminal ANC. There's no doubt that party is a criminal party. A vote for them is a vote for crime. It's as simple as that. But we're stuck with them for the moment. And we need to do something in the meantime. 
And I promise you, all of the initiatives that we've heard wouldn't have come as far as they have if it wasn't for civil society that stepped forward. It's absolutely crucial. No matter how small the, the initiative, civil society must step forward. I'll come back to that now. This specific quote by Albert Schweitzer, I don't know if I say his name correctly, I'm not great at that, so just tongue-in-cheek, when I was in school, they always made me read the, the sport announcements, but I couldn't speak in front of people, and then they always, when there was a game against a German school or something, I could never pronounce the bloody school's name. So it, everyone was laughing, and I had to drink about seven liters of water afterwards just to get my throat cleared. But nevertheless, Albert said that the purpose of human life is to serve and to show compassion in the world to help others. Again, it comes back to the building block of saying, I am second and I am now on the side of hope or hopelessness. And I want to share a story. Alec, you, you, I'm not allowed to share too many crime stories, but this is a story of hope. And you'd ask why, because it's a story of someone that's no longer with us. There's a story of a lady called Liesel de Jager. You would have seen it in the media. Liesel was allegedly, I have to choose my words wisely now, murdered by her husband. And we fought for almost two years just to get the arrest made. And it was a hell of a fight. But there are two things that stood out to me after Liesel's uh, uh, passing or murder was the impact and the legacy that she left behind. Never have I worked on a murder investigation or case where so many people across the spectrum, from poor to rich, different church communities, different religious groups, stepped forward and said, we want to put in a, put in a helping hand to pressure this investigation to getting done. And again, with every person that I spoke about, Liesel, there were two things that stood out. She gave people hope, one, and two, she served other people. She put herself second. And now we have a choice because when I speak to a father, we've got a choice of either neglecting that and saying, we remember Liesl, she was great, but we all move on. As we've been desensitized by crime, we often do that. Or we can say, how can we make Liesl's legacy live on, right? So I divided it up in eight practical steps because people can say this is all philosophical and um, you know, uh, all these quotes and thoughts. But what are those eight practical steps that you can take away from today? Again, whether it's in civil society, whether it's political of some sort, it doesn't matter. When you go and organize yourself in your community with other people, the first thing that I always advise is to determine your purpose. What is your purpose? Is it, is it regarding crime? Is it regarding the environment, the municipality? Whatever it may be, what is your purpose? Then you need to go and determine your goals. You need to determine what are the goals that you can use to measure whether your mission statement was successful. So your purpose, you can link to your mission statement, call it one sentence, and then according to achieving your goals or not achieving them, you can see how, are you, how far you are from reaching your mission statement. You need to agree on terms of accountability. And this is crucial in the community setup because often we have the excuse of I'm a volunteer. But we need to take accountability. And that comes back to what I said earlier about taking, taking ownership. And once you've done that, you create a culture of not only accountability, but a follow-up and a feedback culture. And the two feed off each other. And then suddenly you've got a community where you usually had a neighborhood watch that just patrolled the street. They start cleaning up the street as well. They start training car guards. The municipality says, we actually did it here in Armanas a few years ago. The municipality says, we'll start funding uniforms. We do the uh, vetting on them. We start training them about the restaurants in the area. So when someone parks, we tell them, uh, hey, what do you want to eat tonight? Maybe some fish, I don't know. And, uh, and then they advise you and they become part of the system and they feel there's a sense of ownership and pride. With this is the follow-up and the feedback culture. But then, crucial thing, and Harry said it perfectly when he spoke, is but to keep it simple. And this is part of leadership in that community as well. Keep it simple. We don't need doctrines and books to teach us, you know, massive books with huge plans. Keep it simple. Say, what is your purpose? Five or six goals. What is that one thing that you want to achieve? That one thing. And once you've identified that and you link the goals it's not too difficult to actually get there, and you can start very, very simple. 
The last two is to prep relentlessly, always plan to plan to plan. One of my biggest criticisms towards South African police service at the moment is that they never give feedback. Roland de Vries told me, and he taught me, he made me go crazy about it eventually. He drove me nuts. He, he always said to me that feedback is the breakfast of champions. So I always say to Saps, give feedback even if there is no feedback to be given. Then give feedback about the fact that there is no feedback. But the two things is you give feedback and you plan to plan to plan. And then you are prepared. Victory favors the prepared. I think that's the crucial one. Then lastly, I think, and this is from the book Extreme Ownership, but I'm not sure if it's here. I actually forgot to mention it to you, Alec. But something that I find very important is the idea that um, everyone is accountable all of the time. There's no blame game. I can't just point a finger and say it's just you. And I can go now, as I did with, with the ANC, for example, and point the finger. But the question today is, what am I going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Where is that, that ownership? So my conclusion is that, and again from Albert, I'm not going to say his surname because I probably don't pronounce it right, is that the only ones among you who will be truly or really happy are those who will have sought and found how to serve. And I want to end by reading a little bit of that speech from Theodore Roosevelt, because I think it's so crucial. In the last two weeks, when the, I'm sure we're going to talk about it now, about politics went into the media, um, I read comments and the majority were positive. But it's interesting how many people stand on the sideline and are not involved, especially from a civil society point of view, and want to point either to political parties or to civil society and say, you should be doing this. But no one else is rolling up their sleeves. And Theodore said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, and who strives valiantly, and who, spend, who spends himself in, on a worthy cause, who at worst, if he fails, fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold, timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Thank you very much.